All right. So, um, I am from Diet Eagle. I am a registered dietitian. So, most of you are probably familiar with what dietitians do, but maybe not what they do at Giant Eagle. So, Giant Eagle dietitians work in the store, and they do counseling, they teach classes, they do grocery store tours, so they can help you guys through the aisles and read labels and understand which products are better for maybe certain disease states or certain allergies. So that's what we're there for in the store setting. So for the past four years, I've been in the store setting doing all of that. And just this past month, I transitioned over to our specialty pharmacy as a business. So I now work in an office in a cubicle, which is kind of sad for a retail dietitian who gets to be very active and be in the aisles. So struggling with a little bit of inactivity on my own right now. Um, and what I do at Specialty Pharmacy is anybody who gets their specialty medications for any type of chronic disease like oncology or HIV or transplants, if they get their medications through Giant Eagle, they get all of the services that we provide at Specialty Pharmacy. So they can talk to a nurse on a, as often as they want. They can talk to the pharmacist about any side effects of their medication. They can now talk to a dietitian, to myself, about anything. Maybe it's side effects of medications. Maybe it's something completely unrelated to any of those diseases. And they just want to learn about losing weight or gaining weight or wants some recipes or need some tips on, you know, for taking care of a loved one. So that's what I'm doing now. So I'm excited that I get to come out and be with all of you tonight because I love food. I want you all to love food before you leave. <laughs> so I want to teach you how it's, it's a new year. Um, I know the whole premise of this demo is to think about eating a little bit healthier in the new year. So the recipes I'm doing tonight are in your bag that you received. Um, they're on the printed out papers. So I am making a baked parmesan, chicken parmesan with zucchini pasta. So when I think about eating healthier or trying to help my clients eat healthier in the new year, what do you think of whenever New Year, eating healthier. What types of foods come to mind or are you trying to do now? Healthier for the New Year. Salad. So I didn't want to do a salad for you because I think we all know salads, what, you know, is healthy and maybe what you think of already. So you might not think of chicken parmesan with pasta as being healthy. So I wanted to do a makeover of that recipe and show you little tips and tricks to make your favorite recipes a little healthier. And while we're going through the demo, after the demo, while we're eating dinner, feel free to ask me questions on maybe a recipe that you want to learn how to make a little bit better for you. So that's how I like the hook and how I like to counsel. I don't want to make you eat something or recommend something that is completely outside of your comfort zone and you don't like just because it's healthy. Take what you already do eat and improve it. So that's what we're going to do tonight. So while Virgo's going to help me, so, so we can get you eating quickly, we're actually going to bake the chicken while I demo. So I'm going to show you how to do all the steps leading up to it. But we're going to get those in the oven now so that they're ready for you whenever time to eat. So typically when you bread chicken, what steps do you have to go through? Ooh, <laughs> creepy. So you got to clean the chicken first. So we thawed out the chicken um, or maybe a fresh chicken, whatever it may be. These are really, really large chicken breasts. So first step with making a dish a little bit lighter is getting it in the right portion. So I cut those chicken breasts in half. So these chicken breasts are now thinner. So they should be about the width of your hand, the palm of your hand. So you kind of use that as a guide. If your chicken breast is like stacked that high, you might want to reduce that and cut it in half. Or if you use the chicken tenderloins, those are a little bit more than appropriate portion size too. So first thing is portion, so we just cut those in half. It's also going to bake quicker and less risk of having that raw center is cut thinner. So starting with that, and then typically when we bread something, there's usually three steps, three bowls you need, right? So what are they? Egg, flour, breadcrumbs. So notice I only have two bowls up there, right? So I'm skipping the flour step means I'm going to skip a little bit of the carbohydrates in this, and I'm actually just going to use egg and breadcrumbs, and I am using, um, because our 
Clubhouse had this available for me. The Italian seasoned breadcrumbs, regular breadcrumbs. So this is already seasoned, which means that there is some additional sodium in this. So I typically like to get just plain breadcrumbs. The sodium is much, much lower. So if that is something that you need to pay attention to, high blood pressure, or you do eat a lot of other convenience foods, trying to do the plain is going to be your lower sodium better option, and then we can season it. So I also like to use the panko breadcrumbs. Anybody used these before? I love panko breadcrumbs. They get nice and crispy, so it's going to give us that feeling of kind of that traditional chicken parmesan that's deep fried and nice and crispy. The panko breadcrumbs help you get that crispy exterior. And these, again, are just plain, so the sodium is much lower. So just to give you an idea, for a third of a cup here, it's 420 milligrams of sodium. For a half a cup of the panko, it's only 65 milligrams of sodium. So big difference by getting the plain. And all we're going to do to kind of spice up the flavor of a plain breadcrumb is by adding your own seasoning. So if you're near a market district, I love the spice bulk spice section where they come in these little pouches. They're really, really inexpensive. The only thing in here are herbs, so there's no salt added. When you start to get into like different performance spice blends, usually the first ingredient is salt. So if you're using a breadcrumb that already has salt and you're adding a seasoning that has salt, it all becomes too salty. So it gives you more control. Start with your own flavor um, breadcrumbs. So this gives you some versatility too. So Italian dish, we're going to use Italian breadcrumbs. So I'm going to throw some of that in here. I'm eyeballing. All the measurements are right there for you. Um, since I already did a big batch and this is just six extra, I'm just going to do a little bit here. So it is about half a teaspoon. You're doing four servings or so. The other flavor additive I'm using is granulated garlic. So not granulated garlic salt, just granulated garlic. It's a garlic powder. So this is going to give it a little bit more flavor too without adding that extra sodium. So those are the biggest low sodium tips is using your own herbs and spices. So as the bread comes, because these are already salted, I'm not going to worry about adding that extra salt. On the recipe you'll see I did say you could salt and pepper. Add the pinko, add some pepper to it. And then to make sure that this breadcrumb mixture sticks to the chicken really well, I'm going to drizzle in some oil. So no oil is on hand. If you have olive oil, that's fine too. Drizzling that right into the breadcrumb mixture is going to moisten up those breadcrumbs a little bit. You don't want them completely saturated so they're like mushy, but you want them moistened enough. So just kind of press that oil in with a fork just to moisten them. This will give it some, some sticking power for the chicken. And then to keep this a low cholesterol, kind of heart healthy, I'm going to use an egg substitute instead of using whole eggs. You could use egg whites if you want. Any of that is fine. Um, if you want to use whole eggs, that's fine too. Or do a little bit of, you know, a couple whole eggs and a couple egg whites and, you know, whisk that up. Easy enough. Egg substitute. It's pretty easy. Uh, well, Burger asked me about egg substitute before we, we got started here. You know, what is it? It is egg white <laughs> um, with additional ingredients, with additional vitamins and minerals added to it. Um, there's some thickening agents in here, so, you know, gum to kind of thicken it up a little bit. But it is egg white. It is real egg white, not manufactured egg white. They just add extra ingredients. So when we remove the yolk and just have the egg whites, what do we lose? We lose cholesterol, which is a good thing. What else do you think we lose? We lose some calories. We also lose iron. We lose some B vitamins. So those are added into the egg substitute. So if you just buy egg whites, you're not going to get that extra iron and B vitamins that you will with an egg substitute. I typically do. Just it gives it um, kind of two layers of texture. And it sticks really well. So this is a dish that I do at home a lot. Um, my fiance is one of his favorite dishes. 
Um, the other recipe you'll find in your bags is a recipe for breaded drumsticks. It's the same breading process. Mm -hmm. Not really necessary to wash it. Um, you know, patting it dry a little bit is helpful so that it sticks, everything sticks to it a little bit better, but I mean, as long as you're keeping it at the right temperature and cooking it to the right degree, you're not going to have any issues with salmonella. Make sure you're cleaning the surface areas after you use. Um, make sure you use different cutting boards. So we did all of our avocado and zucchini on that end of the kitchen and all the chicken at this end, so there is no cross-contamination. That's your best safeguard against salmonella. Your hand washing techniques, all of that too. Um, some people just like to wash the chicken, like if you get it and you do frost it in a big bag and like, there's some like up line to get peels or if there's any extra sodium in the packaging, things like that, rinsing it can help reduce that. So. Pretty easy breading process. work. I haven't tried it that way, so I don't want to say 100%. Um, it would help it to stick to that chicken a little bit better, but it's going in the egg wash and then the breadcrumbs. So if you sprayed it with a cooking spray after, it's just going to make those breadcrumbs brown faster. They might not stick as well. Um, the amount of oil that's used in the recipe, it's five teaspoons, so you're getting just over a teaspoon per serving at most, because usually you don't use all the breadcrumbs, you usually have a little leftover. So a teaspoon of oil is not a big deal. You're using a chicken that has been trimmed of any excess fat, so that little bit of healthy fat is not a concern, it's actually a good thing. Um, no, I, don't, I really don't think that the pan would allow the breadcrumbs to stick. I think the egg or the egg substitute or egg white is needed there regardless. Bread a couple more of these. So while I'm breading the rest of these, shoot me some questions. What are some of your resolutions, concerns, struggles you're having with it? You have a dietitian in an hour and 45 minutes at your disposal. Additives meaning what? Preservatives, okay. So, okay. So, I always, I, I do personally and professionally agree that if you can't pronounce everything on the label of your food, it's probably something that you might want to investigate a little bit more or maybe find an alternative for. It. So, sometimes there are additives that are just necessary to be there. Um, forever used salt as an additive of preservative to keep our food fresh and last longer. So that is something that you will see, um, you know, on a lot of items that aren't fresh. So you want to try to eliminate as many additives as possible. Shopping the perimeter of the store. I'm sure you've all heard that before. That's where you want to do the majority of your shopping. Um, that's going to be the most additive-free, preservative-free sections of the store. Of course, we need to dip down into those aisles and get some additional ingredients, um, products. So looking for the shortest ingredient list, being able to pronounce it. Um, we haven't found anything 100% inclusive on certain additives and certain preservatives saying that they cause this or cause that. Um, but the cleaner that you can eat, the least amount of those extra preservatives, I think the better. So there's a lot of fad diets going around like the paleo diet, if you've heard of that, like the caveman diet, going back to the, kind of those days. Yeah, there's all kinds of ones out there. So I still do believe that you should have, you should have balance in your diet. So we don't want to eliminate complete food groups from our diet. 
But when we think about the main food groups, what are they? Just dairy. Give me some other food groups. Meats, vegetables, our fats, fruits. So we want to make sure that we're getting all of those into our diet. So that might, you know, require us to, if we're trying to get our grains in, we're not going to get our grains, you know, on the perimeter of the store. We can get them from the bakery. Those are going to have less preservatives, less sodium than the ones that we find on the shelf because bread from the bakery does not last as long as bread from the shelf, right? So that's an area that if you're concerned about that, try the bakery instead. Um, they have all the ingredients listed on the label. Soon, everything in a grocery store, prepared foods, everything, will have all the nutrition facts available for it. So that law is getting passed, so that will be helpful. Um, let's do three, because we only need it for the pasta, too. Yeah. Yep, we got lots of stuff to do still. So, Good question there on the preservatives. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So the coloring actually um, does get added from some of the vitamins and minerals do add some of that color. So they aren't adding any dyes into this at all. Um, you know, but yellow. Turmeric is a big source of yellow in a lot of foods that is natural. Um, so, yes, I mean, you could certainly just separate your own eggs and leave one yolk in. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep. And also, you have to consider the amount that you're taking in. So, in this egg wash, if we're pouring in a half a cup of egg substitute, how much are you actually getting per piece of kind of a negligible amount. So think about, just like we talked about the portion of the chicken, think about the portion that you're actually consuming. So sometimes we just don't have that option of choosing. Like tonight, you don't have the option. I'm using egg substitute. <laughs> so sometimes we're at a party, we're out at a restaurant, you don't have that option all the time. But what you always have control over is your portion. So might not be able to pick it, you might not be able to plan it, so I call that the three P's. Are you able to pick the best choice, prepare it in a way that is lighter, and then you always have control over that portion. So remembering those three P's, so picking starts in the grocery store, prep is in the kitchen, and then your portion is what ends up on your plate. All right. Um, well, I'm talking <laughs> at the same time, for one. For two, I'm really kind of pressing those breadcrumbs onto the chicken instead of just tossing it. So I really want to kind of pack it on there so that it does stick and stay for me better. So now that those are good to go, chicken in the oven. Next thing we're going to work on is the pasta. So we have our sauce just kind of heating, heating up in the background. That's just going to get topped on later, so you don't need to keep too much of an eye on it. Um, so pasta. Maybe one of those things that maybe you aren't trying to eat right now, trying to cut back on carbs. You can certainly do a whole wheat pasta. It's going to give you a lot more fiber. It's going to keep you fuller longer. You should need a smaller portion of it if you do whole grain pasta. So that is certainly still an option. Has anybody ever tried spaghetti squash before? That's another alternative. Um, some people don't like spaghetti squash because it is a little bit sweeter than, you know, any other type of substitute for pasta noodles. Tonight we're going to do zucchini pasta. So this little tool heel here is called a vegetti. So it's essentially a spiralizer for vegetables. So you can pick this up at Bed Bath & Beyond, at Walmart, order it off Amazon. It is a really easy tool to use. Um, somebody was here, I think it was you earlier, you said that would kind of hurt my wrist to do it. 
So KitchenAid also makes, we were discussing this earlier, um, attachments that there's a vegetable spiralizer on there as well. So then it is really easy to kind of feed it through there. Um, there's ones that look like apple cores and you kind of crank it. So there's all types of different designs out there, but really, really easy. All you need to do is make sure you wash off your zucchini really well. We're going to leave the skin on. We're just going to, um, sure. We're going to just cut off the ends because we don't want that in our pasta. And all we're going to do is actually twist it through. And it's got those little blades in here, but it's just going to kind of turn it into pasta noodles. Really, really easy to do. Ooh. Granted, I did like 25 zucchinis earlier, so that was a little bit more intense than doing one or two. But if anybody wants to come up and try it, this one, I, when I ordered it, it was called a Vegetti. V-E-G-G-I-T-T-I, -T -T -I, I think, or I-T-I, -I, Really, really easy. Um, you know, if you notice it's getting clogged up, just kind of pluck that little seed or core out. You can cut the end off and just keep kind of cranking it. So does anybody want to try it? Brave enough. <laughs> you just got one for your daughter, so you should probably test it out. <laughs> So, you don't, I always like to leave the one end on so you kind of have that safety. There is a guard that comes with it that you can kind of, it has little teeth that clamps on here and you just turn it so you don't get your knuckle in there. There is a blade in there, so be careful. And I, and I did push my hands Okay. This is just for demo purposes because we have plenty here, so you're good. So pretty easy, right? You could put carrots in here. You could do cucumber. Um, it would need to be a smaller yeah. potato. Yeah. Yep. As long as it can fit through there, absolutely. And the guard is nice for those types of vegetables when they're a little bit more awkward so that your hand isn't in where the blade is. Pretty easy. So you can stop where you're comfortable. <laughs> we don't want any blood. So if you keep going, it'll stay in one continuous. So it's recommended to kind of cut it, or you can just stop, pull it out, and continue to go, and then they won't be such long strands. And there is a thinner strand side and a thicker strand side, so depending on the size that you want. Really, really easy. When you're just making a dish for maybe two people, it's just two zucchinis, not 25 in a huge bowl later. Um, so pretty, pretty convenient. The next thing about using a spiralizer is these vegetables have a lot of water content in them, right? So what you want to do is take a cheesecloth or a paper towel and just give that a good squeeze to get some of that excess water out. So the excess water. So when I did this huge bowl earlier, there was actually a pool of liquid at the bottom that just came out of this. So give it a good squeeze. And that'll help so whenever it's cooking, you're going to get some more water out of there as well. Yep, it's still coming out. So when it cooks, you're going to get even more out. So we want to try to squeeze out as much as possible pre-cooking so when it does cook, it's not so watery. As long as it's not running on you, I'm okay. We're just going to quickly throw it in a saute pan just to heat it up. So we don't need it. I think we have so when we throw it in the saute pan, just a little bit of cooking spray just so it doesn't stick, or if you have a good nonstick pan, you don't need any of that. It's just to kind of heat it up. So when our chicken's a little bit closer to being done, we'll throw it in the saute pan, and then we'll top it with the sauce. What I've found is that if you mix it with the sauce, it draws out a lot of that extra liquid. So you don't want to toss it with the sauce unless you're, it's right before you're ready to serve it. So don't let it cook it down. Yeah, you can microwave it. Um, you can actually microwave this, and it will release some of the water and then squeeze it. So if you've ever done anything with, like, cauliflower, made cauliflower mashed potatoes or anything like that, it's recommended to steam the cauliflower, give it a good squeeze with the cheesecloth or paper towels, and then use it for whatever the recipe is. So there's cauliflower pizza crust recipes out there, cauliflower mashed potatoes, using cauliflower in place of rice in, like, a um, fried rice recipe. Yeah. So you can use, this is a great way to get veggies in 
if you don't love veggies as a side dish. So you can sneak them in. Um, but, you know, if you have other family members that don't particularly love veggies, this is a good way to get all those extra nutrients in without having to eat a side of zucchini. So, chicken doing okay in there? Okay. Okay, so we're probably getting pretty close. So, the chicken, when it's starting to get pretty close to being done, we want to actually take it out and put a little bit of sauce on it and cheese it and then put it back in. So, we'll probably give that another couple minutes so we can make our desserts while we're waiting for the chicken to cook a little bit longer. So, if you've pulled out that recipe yet, it is a chocolate avocado mousse. Did you just, just do this? Okay. Your daughter sounds very healthy. <laughs> so this is impressive. <laughs> Good. So the chocolate avocado mousse really decreases the saturated fat content. The saturated fat is the bad fat. That's what you get from like heavy cream that's typically in these recipes or butter that's in these kind of mousse recipes. <laughs> well, we'll see how it is after you try it. It's still good. So we're going to actually just use avocados as our fat and kind of that creaminess of the recipe. So if you haven't played around with avocados before, just want to give them a good slice, separate them. This. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Secret ingredient was? It's kind of like when people do the black bean brownies. Usually people have no idea. We've done that in the store before a couple of times, and nobody guesses what the secret ingredient is. So it may sound odd or like it's not going to be very good, but... It actually is. It's not the most ripe avocado, so. Mm -hmm. It's in there pretty good. I don't want it to go and fly in at anybody. What's that? Oh, I bet. I don't feel like cutting any fingers off tonight, so I'm not going to try to show my flair. But let's see if this one's any better. While well, Berga and uh, Jane had the pleasure of cutting up the other eight avocados I had earlier. Those lovely ladies. Thank goodness for them. So that one was much better. <laughs> yes. So I did buy these a couple days ago. He's still not coming out. Um. So you do want them to ripen. If you want them to ripen faster, which clearly I should have done with these last two, put them in a brown paper bag in a dark place, and they'll ripen faster. Or put them next to your bananas. Bananas give off a gas that actually help ripen, or sometimes that's a bad thing, will over-ripen the fruit that is next to it. So if you have, like, a fruit bowl and you put your bananas in there and you always wonder why your apples get over-ripened or your pears, it's because of that extra gas that's given off. All right, so now that we have the avocado in there, we're still going to add some chocolate. So if we want to melt down some of the chocolate chips, we're going to do a quarter cup of chocolate, semi-sweet chocolate chips. We're just going to throw them in the microwave just to melt them down. So there is actual real chocolate in here, so we're not faking everything out. We're just faking out the fat content a little bit. So, what do we know about avocados? They're green. The monounsaturated fats? Is that what you're trying to do? Mm -hmm. Mm 
omega-3s. So avocados are a great source of healthy fat. They're botanically a fruit because they have that nice big seed in there. But they're healthy fat. They are very, very satisfying. So that's why this dessert a little bit goes a long way. Very kind of nutrient dense here, so we don't need a lot of extra ingredients to go along with it. Um, the other ingredient I'm adding to it is agave nectar. You can use honey if you have honey, that's fine too. Agave nectar, has anybody tried this before? So it's a little bit thinner than honey, you'll see. So a little easier to work with, I just heard. Um, and also, it is a little bit sweeter tasting than honey, so you can use a little bit less. Um, so the recipe here was calling for two tablespoons of honey or a tablespoon and a half of agave nectar. So you can use a little bit less just because it tastes a little bit sweeter. It also digests a little bit slower, so it doesn't spike that blood sugar as quickly. It takes a little bit longer. Anybody know where agave comes from, like what plant? also what you make tequila out of. <laughs> so, doesn't taste like it. You could use it for that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep, it absolutely will. It will be very rich, which is why, right, so the serving size you'll see on the recipe, if you did three-fourths of a cup, I think that's a lot because it's just a very rich um, six half cup servings or tonight I think we're going to do closer to um, a quarter cup serving just because it is pretty, pretty rich. Mm -hmm. Good to know. Worms are a good source of protein, you're right. They do. They're an excellent source of nutrients. And if you're not a big fan of avocados, you know, it's guacamole, things like that, you're not going to really taste the avocado in this because the chocolate really is going to take over for you. And then we're going to add almond milk to kind of get everything moving along in here. You could use regular you know, non-fat milk if you want. I just chose almond milk to make it a little bit more lactose-free friendly. Um, but by all means, use whatever milk you have on hand. We're just doing about a third of a cup. You want to man the food processor for me? My crow over here. So everything just gets thrown into the food processor and blended. That easy. Really, really quick, easy dessert. And we're going to top it with just a little bit of Ready Whip and raspberries. Easy. So you can change it up if you want to do this for the holidays. Do maybe a little bit of mint and raspberry if you want. You can do pomegranate if you want. So whatever appeals to you, strawberries, um, up to you. But that's it. That's all you need. Um, for a really decadent dessert that you're all going to get to taste in a little bit. So we'll see how the chicken's doing. It is getting brown and crispy in there, which is what we want it to do. Um, the other step about the chicken, to back up for one second, is I do use a wire rack. So putting the chicken on a wire rack helps so that the cooking gets all the way around the chicken. So if you've ever cooked it on a tray or on foil and it's kind of that soggy, mushy, bright crumb on the bottom. We don't want that. And it crispy the whole way around. So use a wire rack, spray it, and that'll help with that kind of deep fry the whole way around. Yes. Mm -hmm. so. so while there's our finished mousse from earlier. It's very, very dark. We did use a special dark cocoa powder, too. If you don't like dark, dark chocolate, you can certainly use just regular unsweetened cocoa powder. Because we're adding that extra agave in and everything else, we just use an unsweetened. If you only have sweetened at home, reduce your agave or your honey. 
the almond milk was unsweetened as well. So we're trying to keep that sugar content low. Um, it is a, it's a dessert, so we still want a little bit, but a tablespoon and a half of agave is not very much sugar per serving. Yes. So you're only getting about nine grams of sugar per quarter cup serving, which is not a whole lot, or per half cup serving, sorry. So if you're doing a quarter cup, you're only doing four and a half grams of sugar. So really, really low. <laughs> yeah. So, and that's including the strawberry, or the raspberry on top. So really easy, really quick dessert that's something you can do in advance, let it chill for a couple of hours. Um, it does have avocado in it, so you know avocados eventually will kind of turn and taste a little bit different. So you might not want to do this too far in ahead, you know, maybe not two days in ahead, but a day max, yes. I would say about a day, yeah. It's not, you will, I mean it, It'll still be fine to eat. It just might taste a little different than when it was initially made because avocados, as they kind of they get exposure to air, they do taste a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think that you'll have too much trouble make, having uh, leftovers with this. This is a recipe that uh, my chef at, at one of the Mark District stores last year we came up with for my weight loss class for Valentine's Day, and they couldn't get enough of it. <laughs> so hopefully you enjoy it as much. Um, but we're going to let that hang out, and we're going to work on finishing up the chicken here. So we're going to put that back in the fridge. We're going to pull out the chicken, just put a little bit of sauce on it, put a little bit of Italian blended cheese on it. So per quarter cup, we're getting about 90 calories and 7 grams of fat. So we don't want to go too, too heavy with the cheese more than about a quarter cup, which is more than enough per piece of chicken. Might not even need that much. And it's also the fancy kind of thinner shredded. The reason why I chose this is that the thinner the grate is, the less you need because it spreads and melts better. So that's a little trick. If you're grating your own using like a microplane grater, it will give you a nice real fine grate. And then you don't need to use as much. So another area you can save calories instead of you know, really piling on the cheese. And then we're going to stick it back in and let it melt a little bit. So, a bit. We can take that out. So other questions? Who's got questions? You guys just know everything? <laughs> yes. Um, it'll, no, it won't be the same kind of crispiness. So if you've ever just baked chicken, um, it will be maybe moist and tender, but you're not, without having the breadcrumbs, you're not going to get that crispiness. So you could certainly omit them completely and just do a baked chicken with them sauce and Parmesan cheese on it and, and call it a day. Absolutely. I was trying to give you still kind of that same feel as a restaurant Parmesan chicken, but at home for less calories and much healthier for you. So beautifully brown and crisp. The other thing you'll notice is that there's not a whole lot of breadcrumbs on the bottom underneath there. So that means that, that it really did stick well without having that flour addition to it. So we're going to do a little bit of sauce on here. Yes? No. No. So if you wanted, good question, if you want, I'm right behind you, if you wanted to do gluten-free breadcrumbs, I have a sister who, who eats gluten-free, and I've done stuffing for her before and breading before, just take some gluten-free bread, toast it, let it cool down and dry out, and then throw it, pulse it in your food processor. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where do you want to throw that one on? It would have been okay, but get it back there safely. <laughs> Front row is always the danger zone. <laughs> you can just 
throw a little bit of cheese on top, and then we'll throw them back in just to finish off. So panko breadcrumbs are Japanese breadcrumbs, so you will see them used a lot, like Japanese cooking, um, you know, kind of that crispiness on sushi. But they're just breadcrumbs cut differently, essentially. So there's nothing like, there's nothing weird and in, weird ingredients in there or anything like that. Sounds delicious. All right. So, other questions? We're getting to the end of the demo here. Organic, just enough to fit it. Um, as far as fruits and vegetables, other products, or everything. Okay. So when it comes to fruits and vegetables, there's what's called the dirty dozen. And there's a list of about a dozen fruits and vegetables that are kind of the dirtiest ones that maybe you, if you are going to choose organic, those would be the ones you choose. Um, so think about ones that have really thin skins, um, lettuce, things like that that are hard to clean. Those fall under kind of that dirty dozen. That's the ones that you're going to think about organic those are the ones. Now something like a banana or an orange, you're going to peel that big, thick skin off, right? So one, not much is able to really penetrate that. Two, you're going to get rid of it. So those are ones that maybe you're less concerned about doing organic with. It still all comes down to personal preference. Um, if you are on like a neutropenic diet and you need to be really, really careful of not getting any sort of infection or anything like that, Often people do go more towards organic because they have less of that risk of those um, pesticides and microorganisms. So I can do them. <laughs> I haven't you guys too much. Um, it's, they are not as big of culprits um, because they are typically cooked, more of the cooked ones too. So thinking about that as well. Um, but Bottom line, if you're washing your fruits and vegetables really, really well, you have less concern about any of that. Um, it's Organic comes down to the practices of how they're grown. So whether the farmer is using organic pesticides, no pesticides, um, organic foods tend to be more expensive because those, those types of farming practices are a lot more expensive and they yield less results because they lose a lot of their products without having those pesticides. So it does still come down to personal preference. I you know, can't say one way or the other as far as that. You know, sometimes it's just how you feel about it. Nutritionally, they're all equal. They're all fine. You're still going to get the same calories, the same vitamins and minerals. Um, how you store your food is actually more important than your organic or not. So if you're storing it correctly, if you're keeping it for the right amount of time, if you're washing it properly, all of that is going to safeguard you more than anything else that we can do. So just because it's organic doesn't mean that they're not using pesticides, they're just using an organic pesticide or organic fertilizer instead of the alternative. So they're still using those items just in an organic manner. So be careful. Make sure it's stamped with the organic label. So. It should be. If it's not, I'd be nervous about that. Um, it has to go through that labeling one. Natural, completely different umbrella. Anything can be called natural. And just because it's organic or natural does not mean that it's necessarily healthier. So there are organic crackers and cookies and all types of foods out there. Just because it's organic does not mean that it has a health halo and now you can have as much as you want. So organic cookies still have sugar, just has organic sugar. Still is fat, it's just organic fat. So everything's still in there. It does not give you a license to eat as much as you want just because it's organic. So be careful with that. But good question. I know it's not a definitive answer. It still comes down to personal preference. Um, but if, if you're going to go more towards organic, I would 
you get more towards like lettuce and berries and those types of things that are kind of that more ready to eat that you're not going to wash as well. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yep. So I haven't actually purchased the living lettuce on my own just because I go through so much of it. I would probably still have to buy lettuce. Um, but it's, I mean, it's your own lettuce that you can have at home. You're, you're feeding it. You're watching it grow. You have control over it. So I don't think that there's anything wrong with it. I just don't think it's practical for the amount that I do. <laughs> so, I mean, it comes in like a small little head. Of course, it will grow, but I go through quite a few bags of salad in a week. So <laughs> I'd probably need a couple of those. <laughs> Um, when it's packaged, you're getting a little, you know, they're pumping it with some carbon dioxide just to keep it fresh. So. No, no, it's just, it's your own so that theoretically you could grow your own and have it on demand instead of having to keep buying it. Because some people end up throwing away lettuce so they don't use it quickly enough. If you're growing your own, you just pull off what you need when you need it. So that's the real benefit. Um, the deeper, the darker the color, the more nutrients. So your romaines, your spinach, your kale, those deep, dark greens or reds, purples, those are going to give you more nutrients than iceberg. Iceberg lettuce is 97% water, so you're not, there's not a whole lot of room for vitamins and minerals. So those living lettuce are more of like the leaf and um, like romaine types of lettuce. So those definitely have some nutrients, but spinach is obviously going to give you or darker green. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good practice to do, absolutely. It's just another step in safeguarding yourself against any bacteria, because you never know. I mean, we've seen some recalls on, on you know, bagged lettuce before, so I think it's always a good practice just to give it a, a good wash. Um, salad spinners are fantastic for getting some of that extra water off. And then keeping it in an airtight container or Ziploc bag in your refrigerator is going to help keep it longer. Throw a paper towel in there to kind of absorb any extra moisture that comes out. And yep, that's all you need to do. But yeah, always, always a good idea to, better to wash more than, than not. When it comes to things like your berries, though, you want to wash those right before you use them. So don't bring them home and wash them and then put them in the fridge for a week. You want to wash them right before you use them because they have a little bit more surface area and crevices to get bacteria, so right before use is best to wash. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not. There is a fee involved with it. Um, Highmark used to offer their members free um, weight loss classes and nutrition counseling. They decided to do away with that program across the board, so YMCA's, Giant Eagles, everywhere. So now there is a fee. It is $80 for the 10-week class. So when you break it down, it's not so bad. Unfortunately, it's $80 up front and not per class. But, you know, 10 weeks, an hour each week, it's, it's actually a really, really good deal. It's a fantastic class. I'm definitely going to be missing teaching it this year. Um, so I'm jealous of all my colleagues that get to still teach it. Um, great class, though. So each week you go through a different food group and really intently focus on that food group. So we spend a whole week just talking about vegetables and how to get them in and serving sizes and benefits of the nutrients that come in them. And then the next week you'll talk about fruits and protein and the fats. And everything builds and comes together. So by the end of 10 weeks, you're a master of all the food groups and portions and reading labels. So it's a fantastic class. Often our dietitians are able to bring in and do little mini demos or let you taste products, um, bring in food labels so you can actually practice reading them. So love that class. So if you have a, a location near you that you're interested in, you can check on our website to see if there is a class going on there. So not every store has them, but we do have several stores that will have them. So diningo.com slash dietitian. You'll find all the info for that. So yeah, I would encourage you to. It's a good way to keep you accountable too. So 
Like everybody in this room probably has a really good idea of what's healthy and what's not, but it's doing it. So when you're committed to going every week and you know that you got to step on a scale every week and somebody might be looking at your food journal every week, you're much more accountable. And doing that for 10 weeks builds that habit so that you continue to do it. By the end of 10 weeks, it starts to become just, that's just what you do. So. All right, our cheese is nice and melted, so we can probably turn that off. Zucchini is in the saute pans. Like I said, we're just kind of giving it a nice heat up, and we're just going to pour the sauce over top of the zucchini and the chicken when it comes out. So we're going to get ready to serve it all, so we want everybody to kind of move into the next room, I think, the plan. So you can go find your seats out there. How do you want to do this? Hold up. <laughs> okay. Oh, you have the plates in here. All right. That we can do. I can handle that. Sure. So we're going to do this. We're going to plate it, and then they can take it out with them. So we're going to do zucchini first with sauce, and then throw the chicken on top of it. That'll be probably the easiest way. All right. So, Kathy, you want to start us to take the first place and go down the line? I'm working on it. Sure. That'd be fantastic. Looks yummy. Thank you so much. It's going to be warm, so be careful. You can put the chicken on top or next to it. It doesn't matter. Might stay crispy if it's next to it. Either way. Either way, it's fine. What's that? That's fine. I'll scoot it to the side then. Yeah, it's really easy. We do this a lot. Squash. Yeah, I make like a lasagna with spaghetti squash. Spaghetti squash just takes so long to cook. <laughs> That's usually a downfall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we um, usually roast ours with some garlic and salt and pepper. And just takes a little longer. It's always hard to get it cut. Yes. Oh my gosh, Whoa. it's really, really intense to cut. You know what I use? I use a, like a watermelon a meat cleaver, cleaver okay. and a mallet. Oh, to like crack through it. That's so fair. You know. Yeah, I cooked for the vegan chef for a while. Oh, okay. I'm actually a volunteer here. I'm doing a smoothie workshop next Oh, okay. Week. Yeah, so I read right about you. I to watch yeah. and see. You did a great job. Thank you. See what, how you did it. Smoothies will be fun. There's so many possibilities of smoothies. <laughs> 